So we're going to do the wife, uh, wife of Bath's prologue in tail today. Uh, send her a long email about you know, a couple of videos, links, read the general prologue, know those characters, et cetera, et cetera, with some background information. I'll, I'll probably, take the back, well, probably, I will allude to some of that um, today. We, we may not get entirely done with um, the tale, probably will, but we'll get very, very close. So that if we need to, when we meet again a week from today, might spend five or ten minutes, if again, only if needed, to um, conclude a little bit about the tale before getting into this stuff about the Renaissance. Okay. Um, so, let me back to something that was in those lectures. Chaucer gives us portrayals in the general prologue of all the members of the pilgrimage, right? Some of the people, he gives us very detailed descriptions. The knight, for example, the wife of Bath, um, the prioress, the friar, the summoner, the partner, etc. Others, he, he just mentions. There's a manciple... There's a chip's cook. There's a blah, 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 okay? Uh, Canon Yeoman, he says hardly anything about. The nuns, priests, three, doesn't discuss. Just mentions them, okay? But those that he does discuss, and those that he discusses at length, he's doing two things, okay? He's giving us the PR version of themselves, like they walk around with fancy brochures, Here's who I am. This is who, this is how I want all of you to see me, right? And then what does Chaucer do? He kind of gives us his perspective. So we get the, the official version, and then we get the, but here's kind of what they're really like. And what Chaucer is doing there is he creates the persona of the character, and the persona of the character will kind of determine the kind of tale the person will tell, right? But then Chaucer undercuts that persona slightly. So initially we'll get, you know, for example, the prioress. We'll get a, a beautiful glowing portrayal, but then Chaucer adds just a couple of little details that undercut it a little bit. For example, she's a prioress. That is, she runs a women's monastery, today often called a convent. She's the one in charge. Vows for monks and nuns involve what? Chastity, purity, silence, um, poverty. And yet she's dressed to kill. Who is her quote unquote lover? God. Nuns are brides of Christ. What does she wear around her neck? A big old golden A. Capital A. And underneath it says, Amor vincit omnia. Love conquers all. Now, you could be charitable and go, Oh, that's divine love. No, because divine love is caritas. Amor is romantic, sexual love, okay? She shouldn't be wearing that, you know, other stuff. So we get the portrayal of the wife of Beth. I'm not gonna say much about it. I'm just gonna point out one little detail, which, you know, for a modern audience, we're like, what? How did they get that? She has a gap between her two front teeth. So a lot of people have gaps between their two front teeth. They didn't have orthodontists. That gap in the Middle Ages was an indication of sexual looseness. It means you were lecherous, you were licentious, you slept with whoever, whenever you want. Okay? She's portrayed as this kind of pillar of the church. I mean, she's been on all of these pilgrimages. She's been to, I think, Jerusalem three times, Rome a couple times, Cologne and the San Juan de Compostela and, you know, uh, not San Juan, the pilgrimage tour in Spain. 
Yes. Um, why was that a time? No idea. It's so many of my first class was like, and I, I know. There's no explanation. It's just, it's referred to frequently, and not just from the Middle Ages up through the Renaissance. You know, so we'll be watching a movie, and I'll, you know, and there'll be someone with that, and I'll go, watch. That person's going to start sleeping. And almost invariably, weirdly enough, it happens. The person who is, you know, sleeping around with everybody has a gap between them. His or her teeth. Yes. Is that why? I think it's like Maybelline or like some kind of makeup company. They have like this red lipstick and the models that are like wearing it have a big gap in their teeth. You think that's why? Wow. I didn't know that. Um, <laughs> more than likely, yes. Because a lot of these images do carry forth. With, to today without even being thought of, okay? So we get that depiction of her. We, we find out, you know, she gets jealous of other women cut in front of her in line at church because, you know, she kind of wants to be seen and first and foremost. In other words, she has a bit of an ego, okay? And we're told how many times she was married. So now we get to her prologue. And the wife of Bath's tale, by the way, I was just going to mention this briefly. The Wife of Bath's Tale is the first of seven tales that George Lyman Kittredge, one of the trinity of Chaucer scholars in the early 20th century, I mean, he's one of the, the biggies. He was the professor of my Chaucer professor. Um, Kittredge suggested that these seven tales form what's called a marriage group. That is, they all focus on marriage. Which is largely true. Marriage is a central focus of the Wife of Bath's Tale, the Friar's Tale, the Sumner's Tale, Clerk's Tale, Merchant's Tale, Squire's Tale, and the Franklin's Tale. Interestingly, the partner interrupts the Wife of Bath twice. The Friar intervenes one of those times. Friar's Tale comes next. The partner and the Sumner are traveling together, okay? Um, which I'll talk a little bit about later. The problem with this is almost all of the tales throughout the Canterbury Tales involve, one way or another, marriage. It's not that, they're the that it's the central focus of all of them, as it does kind of seem to be in these. But I would even argue, with the Wife of Bath's Tale, is marriage the focus? No. It is a subject, but it's a subject like it's a springboard. It's a jumping off point to get to the real focus. This, ultimately, is the real focus. Gentilessa, okay? Even though that's not the focus of the prologue. The Wife of Bath's prologue is twice as long as her tale. So that an awful lot of readers say, well, it's what Chaucer spends the most time on, so it must be the most important thing. Possibly. Or it could be Chaucer spends that much time on it because he's giving the, the wife an awful lot of rope. Anybody know what phrase I'm alluding to? To hang herself with. She just goes on and on and on and on, talking about all these different kinds of behaviors. And then she tells this kind of tale, showing, I'm going to kind of give the last two minutes of what would normally be a normal lecture, showing she, the wife of Beth, has none of this. OK? She does not show or demonstrate gentilessa. And I'll, just, I'll define it later when we get into her actual tale. One comment, and this is made in those two video lectures. Of all the people in the Canterbury Tales, or let me rephrase that, of all the pilgrims that are described in the general prologue to the Canterbury Tales, only two does Chaucer portray wholly good. That is, no undercutting of the character. Nothing 
dark, hidden, secret, negative about those two characters. The first one is the parson, and the second one is his brother, the plowman. Parson, the lowest priest level of the church. Okay? The plowman, the lowest level of society. What would we call the plowman today? Ditch digger. That's what he does. He digs ditches. He digs holes using his hands and a shovel. And read what it says about them both in the general prologue. The plowman does this for free if you can't pay him. The parson pays other people's tithes if they can't afford it out of his own pocket. He is Chaucer, Chaucer the narrator, not Chaucer the author, says is a perfect image of Christ. In other words, those two characters, no hypocrisy. Every other character, every other pilgrim is in one way or another hypocritical. They say something, they do the something else. Okay, So, having said all that, Wife of Bath's prologue. Experience, I'm going to translate modern English as we go. Experience, though of no authority were in this world, were right enough to me to speak of woe that is in marriage. Okay? If there were no authorities, what does she mean by authorities? Philosophers, theologians, thinkers, writers, Every one of you, you know, because you're all English majors, you've got to write papers for classes. What do you have to do in those papers? What do, I won't say all, can't say that anymore, but do most of your professors require your papers to include? Citations. Citations to? Authorities. People who have written about what you're writing about. Why? Because... I don't mean anything personally, okay? I'm being facetious. Because you're just dumb English majors who don't know any better. So you're going to cite people who have been writing about this stuff for years or maybe months, okay? Some of them. You're citing them because they know about it. She's saying experience? No, no, no. I don't need anything more than experience to teach me about what? Woe in marriage. Woe. Suffering. She's going to talk about authorities throughout the prologue. And who does she mean? Writers like, um, names just, Jerome, St. Jerome, Jovinian, Paul, St. Augustine, Ovid, a whole bunch of lists of writers. They're all, by the way, male. <laughs> okay. Her experience is enough to speak of one that is in marriage. For lordings, she's addressing all the other members of the company as lordings. The ings, it's like little lords. Now, technically speaking, probably none of them, with maybe the exception of one, are of lordly status. That one would be the knight. Okay, possible he's a knight. We're uh, possible he's a lord. We don't know for sure. He's never. It's never actually said. She says, since I was twelve years of age, thanks be to God that is eternally alive. Husbands at church door, I've had five. She was first married at the age of twelve. She's been married five times. Okay. I don't know that Chaucer read this work that I'm going to allude to, that I'm going to mention in a minute, but it wouldn't surprise me because it was popular in the Middle Ages. It was translated into Old English. It was translated into Middle English. Chaucer read widely. Okay. But there's a book, a story, called The Life of St. Mary in Egypt. Okay. 
Again, translated into Old English, translated into Middle English. Because St. Mary of Egypt is one of the preeminent saints in the church. All right? She's preeminent because of repentance. She's a kind of preeminent um, saint of repentance. Here's why. According to the life of St. Mary of Egypt, this was, according to the tradition, according to the story, dictated by her to a priest who wrote it down, gave it to another priest. And she lived in the, I always forget, late 6th, early 7th centuries. Late 500s, early 600s. Okay? So she tells her. She's from Alexandria, Egypt. And from the age of 12 to the age of 19, uh, 29, so for 17 years, she loved sex. Just loved it. If it moved, have sex. Didn't charge. Just, she just loved having sex. Nymphomaniac. Slept with anyone, everyone she could. At the age of 29, okay, there's a group of men that are going from Alexandria to Jerusalem. They're going to go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem and worship. I think, she's, I think it's right around Easter, what's called Pascha in the East. And she's like, cool, never been to Jerusalem. I'll go too. Okay? She pays her way by having sex with the sailors on their way. So she doesn't have to buy a ticket, so to speak. She gets to the church. And so here's this door that leads into the nave of the church. And there's a big old icon of Mary right here. And she looks at the icon of Mary. She starts to go through the door. She can't. The door is open. But it's like there's it's a barrier. She bounces off, tries again, bounces off. She falls down on her knees in front of the icon of Mary and prays to Mary, let me go in, let me worship and pray before the cross because Christ's cross is in the church at this time, right? And I will reform my life. I'll go off into the Jordan, blah, blah, blah. Jordan just meaning go on the other side of the Jordan River into the desert, okay? She gets up, tears streaming down her face, and she goes in. She comes back out. She goes across the River Jordan. She's given, I think it is, a couple pieces of bread, goes off, she lives on the other side of the Jordan River for 47 years. Until she's 73. She meets this guy named Zosimus, etc. Tells him her life, etc. That's all I'm going to refer to about her. She is the image of repentance. Okay? But that all starts, and this is the only reason why I mentioned to it, at the age of 12. She's married at the age of 12. Okay? She's had five husbands. So, a lot of people have had five husbands or five wives, etc. Not in the Middle Ages. Why? St. Augustine, original sin, essentially said, original sin is somehow tied up with sex. Or at least that's how the Middle Ages interpreted what St. Augustine said. And the Catholic Church interpreted it. So the Catholic Church said, you gotta have se- you gotta get married and have sex to propagate the race so that we don't die out, but don't enjoy it. It's the enjoying of the sexual act that is sinful. So it's okay to get married once. Not divorce and get married. That's a no-no. Okay? But if your husband dies, you can get married again. Even St. Paul says that. Even Jesus says that. Okay? Cool. If that husband dies, you shouldn't really get married again. You, you should have gotten it out of your system, you know, so to speak. But it was allowed. She gets married five times, we're told, at the church door, meaning the church. Now, how she got priests, or a priest, to marry her five different times I have no idea. Because if a single priest knew her, and she's getting married like every two years, one, you would think, call the coroner, because something's happening to her husbands. Two, 
No, the church doesn't allow that many marriages. So it had to be she got married here, and maybe she got married here again, and then she got married here, and then she moved over here to find a new priest kind of a thing, okay? I've been married five times. For so I oft have wedded me, and all were worthy men in their degree, that is, in their particular station in society. But me was told certainly not long ago is that since that Christ never went once but what to a wedding, that we should only be married once. First miracle, turning the water into wine at the wedding at the marriage in Cana. But the Gospels mention only one wedding that he goes to. It's inferred from that that you should only marry once. Cool. Whatever. Okay? She says, um, okay, so let's leave the wedding and let's go to the story of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. Jesus meets this woman. Within a hundred years of that event, according to the Gospels, within a hundred years, that woman is named by the church. Her name is St. Fotini, right? So she goes there. She asks, you know, would you like some water? Jesus says, if you knew who I was, you would ask for me for water. She goes, you don't have a cup. He goes, he who drinks from my water will never thirst. I would like some of this water. And he proceeds to tell her she's had five husbands. And the man she's living with now isn't her husband. You're a prophet, more so. Okay? So she talks about that. She says, um, was no husband, excuse me, why that the fifth man was not husband to the Samaritan? How many might she have in marriage? Yet heard I never told in my age upon this number definition. That is, Christ never said you can have X number of wives in succession, not simultaneously, okay? Where does the Bible say this many, no more? It doesn't. Men may divine, that is guess, and gloss right in the margins, up and down. You're not going to find it. Now she's kind of telling us a bit of a biblical scholar. I've read the Bible in, you know, Latin. It wasn't available in English, by the way. No, here's what she reads. God bed, line 28, for us to wax and multiply. What did he tell Adam and Eve? Be fruitful and multiply. Have lots of little Adam and Eves running around. That gentle text, I understand. Because what does it mean? Get down to the nitty-gritty. Have sex. She's going, I like that text. Also, well, I know, he said my husband should leave his father and mother and take me. But he never said any number. He never said only one husband. No, 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 no made no number mention of bigamy, two, four, I love this, octogamy, eight husbands. She's had five. She's going to tell us in a few minutes. She's doing what? What is possibly one of the reasons she's on this pilgrimage, other than to go pray at the shrine of the holy martyred Saint Thomas Becket? She's on the prowl for number six. Okay. So, she says, Blessed be God, line 44, that I have wedded five. Welcome the sixth whenever he shall. That is, I am welcome to the sixth. She's kind of going... No, no, now the night, hmm, maybe, because high standing in society, probably deep pockets. 
Forsooth, I will not keep me chaste. That is, I won't remain chaste. I won't not have sex. When my husband is from the world gone. When my husband dies, I'm not going to stop. I'm... Some Christian man shall wed me anon. That is, soon. The God says immediately. It doesn't have to be immediately. It can just mean soon. For then the apostle says, I am free to wed where it liketh me. What, what, is it, what does she mean? If my husband dies, Paul says, I can remarry. He doesn't say there's a number. Again, she's going to beat that horse till there's no flesh on it. Yes? Are they implying that she's trying to justify like getting married to multiple men like by saying, like, oh, even St. Paul didn't question about this? When she literally just said, like, I'm going to keep on having premarital sex. Or postmarital, or <laughs> whichever it is, okay? But what does she, she keep doing? She says, I don't need any authority to tell me about woe in marriage. And then she repeatedly appeals to these. And in doing so, throughout her prologue, what does she set herself up as? An authority on woe, difficulty in marriage. So this is getting at what I was talking about what Chaucer does in the portrayal of the pilgrims and undercutting. She rails against the authorities, and yet she sets herself up as one. That's hypocritical. Why does she rail against the authority? I mean, let's, this is all the prologue. Why does she rail against the authorities? First, who are they, and what are the authorities about? You're in Sydney. That's pretty much it. Well, let me repeat that. <laughs> They're men, right? What do you mean by she doesn't like them? She doesn't like them telling what to do. She doesn't like them telling what she does like men, though, right? <laughs> I mean, it's pretty clear. She really likes men, okay? She doesn't like these men, these authorities, telling her how to live her life, either outside of marriage or inside of marriage. Because St. Paul says, outside of marriage, no sex. I mean, Paul says, I wish that all could be like I am, meaning unmarried. Okay? But if you can't, if you burn, you have lust, you know, that kind of stuff, he says, get married. Why? There's your outlet. Nothing premarital outside, nothing outside marriage. Okay? So, and she goes on, better it is to be wedded than to burn. Line 52 on page 332. Notice, by the way, little, you know, history of the English language for 30 seconds. Brenna, B-R-E, or B-R-Y-N-N-E. Chaucer, in his book, The Parliament of Fowls, has a line where he mentions the Thrida Brenda. T-H-R-I-D-D-E, B-R-Y-D-E. Why the R and then the vowel? Because from then to today, from then to Shakespeare's day, a process called metathesis occurs. The R and the vowel get switched. We don't know why, we don't know how. It just does. It's like the gap between the teeth. Okay? So, three to Brita, third bird, Brenna, Berna. And what does she do? She starts quoting the Bible. Okay, not quoting alluding, paraphrasing. She mentions Lamech, she mentions Abraham, you know. Abraham had more than one wife. Well, not really. He had Sarai, later Sarah, and then concubines. Okay. So, I pray you, 61, telleth me where God commanded virginity. I know as well as ye, it is no dread. When the apostle speaks of maidenhead, he said that precept thereof had he none. What does she mean? He didn't have his virginity? Nope. Males can't be virgins, by the way. Our society seems to not think that. He had no precept. That means commandment. 
Paul says, this is from me, not of the Spirit. Okay? That's what she's alluding to. Paul didn't say, thus saith the Lord. All right? Men may counsel a woman to be one, singular, that is, not joined to another. I keep losing my place. But counseling, it's not the same. It's not a thus says the Lord. What's her point? If it ain't a commandment, I'm not doing it. So, let's see here where to pick up. Um, she goes on and talks about Paul wishes every man was like he was, but it's counsel, etc. So it's no reproof to wed me if my mate, line 83 and following, uh, 84 and following, no reproach or reproof that if my mate dies to get married again. Without exception of bigamy, that is, with, with that exception. You can't be married to two simultaneously. And it's, not, it's good for no women for to touch. He meant in, in his bed or in his couch, etc. Okay? So she goes on, and we're going to skip a bunch. Um, now I'm going to skip that part. Lines. I'm trying to think where to pick these up. Um, 143, 144, and 5. <coughs> She's talking about the difference between breads white bread and barley bread. White bread is where the flour is ground extremely fine, it was the most expensive bread there was. Barley bread is what we would call whole grain bread. The, the meal isn't ground as finely. So you get pieces that can crack your teeth and stuff in it. Okay? Why does she bring up bread? Because she says, um, let them be bread of pure white seed and let us wives hot barley bread. That is, let the virgins be like this pure white bread. And let us wives, let us be what? Let us, let us be the kind of bread that everybody gets a piece of, so to speak. Okay? That probably wasn't worded the best way. Um, and yet, with barley bread, Mark can tell. That is the gospel of Mark. Our Lord refreshed many a man. What's she talking about? Feeding of the 4,000, feeding of the 5,000, etc. That wasn't finely ground bread. That was bread probably baked at home in somebody's oven. Okay? In such a state as God hath claped us, called us, I will persevere. What state is she talking about? I'm not precious. I'm not fastidious. I'm not particular. Precious, fastidious, particular about what? In wifehood, I will use my instrument as freely as my maker hath it said. That is, I'm going to use my sex. Not femininity, my sexual organs, as freely as God gave them to me. Okay, now, this is written late 1380s, early 1390s. She's surrounded by primarily men there are some women. What kind of women are they? There aren't any hookers in this group, by the way. Nuns. Okay? And they're probably going, oh, my poor ears, you know, except for the chief nun, because she's going, yes, yes. One like me, you know. If I be dangerous, and your gloss says stand offish, I don't think that's really what it means. God, give me sorrow. My husband shall have it both eve and morrow. I'm going to have sex with my husband morning and evening. I lost my place again. Whenever he pleases. And husband I will have, I will not stop. Okay? She got her point across. I mean, we're what? 150 lines in. She likes sex. 
Okay? Partner in her ease. Now, Dane, by God and by St. John, you are a noble preacher in this case. Noble there probably means effective, good. What case? I was about to wed a wife. Alas. Why does it end with alas? God save me. Not going to now. What should I buy it on my flesh so dear? Why should I pay? Okay. For, for what? For marriage so dearly with my flesh. That is, I would be a damn fool if I were to get married now. After listening to you, because what is he taking? How is he listening to the wife? What is he taking her as? An authority. Ye had I never wed no, yet had I never wed no wife this year. I would rather not marry this year or get a wife this year. Okay, pause for a moment. He's kind of looking to her as an authority. Um, assuming you're not married, assuming you want to get married at some point, let's assume you have a significant other that you're talking about marrying. Who do you want to look to as a model or authority for marriage? Someone who's been married five times, short little marriages, you know, or someone who's been married once for 50 years. Which one tells you more how to be married? Well, if it's about how to go through the role of finding someone to marry and get married, probably the one who's been married multiple times, because that person's pretty good at picking up a spouse. The one who's only been married once, kind of a failure, really. I mean, think about it. I mean, really, you can only get married once? Yeah, but it's 50 years, you know. Good model to follow? Hmm, we'll see. So she's, abide, my tale has not yet begun. 169 lines. And she hasn't gotten to her tale yet. Okay? Stop drinking. That's what she tells them. You shall not have drink of another ton, ton like a cask of beer. They're bringing it with them, by the way. <laughs> Got to keep the whole whistle wet while you're traveling. And when that I have told forth my tale, and she's telling us what the tale will be about, of tribulation that is in marriage, of which I am the expert in all mine age. All mine age your gloss says throughout my life, that is from the age of 12 till now. We don't know how old she is. Theoretically, I mean, if you look at the drawing, the illustration of her at the beginning of your sex selection from the Ellesmere manuscript, one of the two most important manuscripts of the Canterbury Tales. This is now in California. Um, the other one is called the Hingwert manuscript, which is in Wales, okay? Total of 85 complete manuscripts of all the tales. Over 90 fragments of the tales. Chaucer, people really liked Chaucer, because these are all handwritten. None of these are printed. Once printing comes around, Katie bar the door. I mean, they're just printing Canterbury Tales like crazy, okay? In all my age, from the age of 12 to now, how old is she? Well, that picture doesn't make her look old. You don't see any wrinkles, for example. Face looks smooth. She theoretically could be, if she was married at 12, and her first husband was old, she could be 20. I mean, if they die every year, again, you would think a coroner would get involved, because a little suspicious. And, and one comment, by the way, because I didn't mention this. <clears throat> We're kind of implied. The first three husbands that she marries, she marries them for their money. Which kind of implies they're older. Okay, they've built up a pot. 
the last two husbands, they marry her for her money. Why? Because she's in Aaron. The money from the first three. She's loaded. Okay? But we're also, just one second, Lily. But we're also told she marries four and five for love. Okay? Yes? Um, I thought, like, in this time period, women couldn't inherit. Nope, it's not true. They could. Money. They could. So, like, all these TV shows are, like, mm. they're, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Popular. So women could own property? Yes. Oh. Popular BS. It was difficult for, well, let me qualify that. What kind of women? If you're talking about like a peasant girl, more than likely not, because it takes money. High standing, definitely. She is upper middle class. We're told she has a skill, for example. She's a weaver. And she is on a par with the best weavers, we're told, of Flanders and Ghent, I think it is, of Flemish weavers who are the best in the, in the Western European mind. She's as good as they are. So even though she marries these three for money, she also still has probably wealth of her own making because of her ability in weaving. Okay? Um, but yeah, I mean, women of status, women of money, of women of means, they could buy and sell, okay? There were other parts of, of what do you want to call it? Um, there were some laws that, that definitely limited women's abilities. There were laws that regarded, uh, not, not that regarded, there were laws regarding what men could do to women, what husbands could do to wives, fathers could do to daughters. I don't mean sexually. I mean in terms of you know, punishment. Like a child could beat his daughter. I, I think there's a law that says something with a rod no thicker than one's thumb. Okay, That's pretty thick. If you imagine being hit with a stick. Okay? I mean, you could obviously kill somebody like that. There were laws against killing, you know, things like that. But a, a lot of what you see in television is just, it's like Shakespeare. It ain't history. Shakespeare, when, with Shakespeare's history plays, he wasn't writing history. He was writing fiction. The history's wrong. For example, Shakespeare's history, um, Henry IV plays, where you've got King Henry IV and Prince Hal, who will become Henry V. In those plays, Hal is the same age as a guy named Harry Hotspur. Harry Percy. In reality, there was a real Hotspur, real Harry Percy. He was the age of Henry IV. He was like 20 years older than Hal. Shakespeare makes them contemporaries. Why? He needs a good foil for Prince Hal. So he has Hotspur be his age rather than Harry's father's age. Okay? Um, so she goes on. And the partner interrupts again. Dame, I would pray, if you will, it here said this partner, um, keep going. That is, I want to hear this tale. You know, he's not totally convinced not to marry. But if she's going to talk about tribulation and marriage, let it all out. Okay? She says, I will. At line 193. Her tale... Is 850, her, excuse me, her prologue is 856 lines long. She still has 600 lines of the prologue before she's going to get to her tale. Why? Because the prologue is that important? A lot of people read, when they read the prologue of The Wife of Bastille, they think the prologue's the most important thing because it's longer. Not really. What's Chaucer, the author, doing by giving her so long a pro It's the longest prologue in the entire Canterbury Tales, I'm pretty sure. What's he do other than the general prologue? Take that back. No, the general prologue is only 
790 some lines, right? Not even that long. Take the back. It's 858 lines. It's two lines longer than the wife's prologue. So what's Chaucer doing? Have you ever heard the phrase, give someone enough rope? How's the rest of it go? And they'll hang themselves. Chaucer's saying, have at it. Use all the words you want. Why? He's going to use her prologue to show her hypocrisy. Okay? So, she says the tale's going to be about, uh, how did she put it? Tribulation and marriage and such. Okay? So she says, I will. Now I'm going to tell you about my husbands. Three of them were good, two were bad. The three men were good and rich and old. These three, okay? Her last two were bad. And I think the implication partly is they weren't rich and they weren't old. They married her for money. They berated her. The first three apparently didn't. She doesn't tell us much about the first three. It's the last two that she really emphasizes. Okay? Um, no, we're going to skip that. We get her name, line 320. She's called Dame Alice. Another place, she's Alice Sun. L-A-Y-S-O-U-N. Another place, it's Y-S-O-N. Doesn't, spelling doesn't matter. Okay. Um, I want to get to the end of the prologue so that we can get on. So, her fourth husband's named Jenkin, etc. She, who used to beat her and stuff. Her fifth husband, we get introduced to on page 339, line 503. Jenkin is dead. One through four have died. We don't know how. We don't know if there are suspicious circumstances. Not saying there are, just, you know, it seems kind of odd. Anyways, now of my fifth husband, I will tell God, let his soul never come in hell. In other words, may his soul rest in peace and not in eternal damnation. Cool. And yet was he to me the most shrew. She's going to use the word be shrew later on. It's going to mean curse. So he was kind of cursed. Not like he had a curse on him, but rotten mean SOB. Okay? That she feels on her ribs all in a row. He was so shrewish, he beat her. That's what she means. She has the bruises, so to speak. Okay? I loved him best. Line 5, 12 or so. Um, yeah, let's go to line 10. When that he would have my Bella Schwa, her pretty thing, sex, that um, though he had me beaten on, even though he had beaten me on every bond, he could win again my love immediately. What kind of relationship are we talking about? We see it all the time today still, even though most women know not to stay with someone like this, right? He's an abuser, we would say. And yet she keeps going back. Or she never leaves. Another way of putting it. He would have my love again. I trow, I believe, I loved him best. Why? For that he was of his love dangerous to me. And your gloss tells you stand offish. What? His love. He was of his love. Stand, what does it mean to be stand offish? Distant. What does she mean? He acted like he didn't love her. 
he acted like maybe within marriage he didn't need sex. What did that do to her? It's weird, right? It made her want him even more. Look at what she says. We women have, if I don't lie, in this matter, a quaint fantasy. Fantasy, odd whim. What thing we may not lightly have, that is the thing that we can't easily get, thereafter will we cry all day and crave. Forbid us something, and that's what we want. Tell us, no, you can't have it, and we'll want it even more. Press on us fast, that is, try to force us to take something or to enjoy something, and we don't want it. We'll flee. With danger out we all are shafar, and you've got to gloss there what that means. Great press at market maketh dear wear, and to great cheap is hold at little price. All right? Too much merchandise, too great to cheap. That's where the word cheap comes from. It just means good product. Cheap side in London is where not the cheap, you know, Chinese stuff was made, so to speak. It's where goods were sold. This knoweth every woman that is wise. And I kind of imagine, you know, the wife sitting up there on her horse, and she looks at the nuns prior, she goes, right? And he looks at a couple, yeah, you're right. I'm not saying she's right. I'm saying she's saying she's right. My fifth husband, God bless his soul, notice, dead, <laughs> which that I took for love and no riches, and there she tells him she married number five because she loved him, not because he was rich. He once was a clerk at Oxford. Well, there is a clerk from Oxford on the trip. So she's going to describe her husband. And within three tales after this, the clerk is going to tell a tale. Why? Payback. He's going to tell a tale of real love. Not her version of real love. Okay? So what does that mean he was a clerk of Oxford? Clerk or clerk means someone studying for the priesthood. He was a student, okay, but he was studying for the priesthood. That means he could read, he had read, and he probably had a collection of books like the clerk in the Canterbury Tales does. We're going to be told, or we're told in the general prologue, he has a library of 20 volumes. He has those with him. Or he has those where he lives. Let me put it that way. For him to have 20 books, okay, and he dresses threadbare clothes. Why? Because he's a student. He's poor. No, you know, student loans. He spends all of his money, what? On books. For him to have 20 books, it'd be like you owning all the books in a Walker Library. I mean, it's huge, because every one of those books is extremely expensive. It's costly to have a book made. So, she goes on and talks about him, and he talks, and her, her name, you know, was Allison, et cetera, et cetera. Um, she talks about Jenkin, my name, Alice, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now we need to skip all that. So she goes on and quotes just one authority after another. Christian authority and even non-Christian authorities, classical stories, all right? Line 711. But now to purpose why I told thee that I was beaten for a book, all right? One night, Jenkin, her husband, and this is confusing, to me at least, because at one point her told, we're told her fourth husband is named Jenkin. Now she seems to be implying her fifth husband is also named Jenkin. 
uh, I know a woman, her first husband was named Paul and she's remarrying and her next husband's named Paul too. Like there's Pauls in the you know woodwork. Anyways, I told you I was beaten for a book. Now let me tell you why. Upon a night, Jenkin, that was our sire, that is my master, okay, read on his book as he sat by the fire of Eve first. And when it says he read, it doesn't mean what am I doing? Reading silently. He read aloud. Is he reading aloud because he's reading to her? Not necessarily. There's been a lot written about when did silent reading begin? We know in ancient times, reading wasn't done silently. We have accounts of people walking by and hearing something being read out of a house with only one person in there. Okay? We know in the early Middle Ages, reading still wasn't done silently. It's sometime in the later Middle Ages that reading goes from being read out loud to silent re reading up here. Okay? But he's reading aloud. And he reads what? He starts with Eve. That for her wickedness was all mankind brought to wretchedness. Starts with Eve. What's the implication? And he goes from Eve to the next one, and to the next one, and to the next one, and to the next one. Kind of like, what did we see in Sir Gowan and the Green Knight? Sir Gowan's, <laughs> damn that Eve. And then, damn that Delilah, and then damn that Bathsheba, and then damn all Solomon's wives. Why? Because they made those good men go bad. Okay? This is what he's reading. And she gives a bunch of examples. Okay? Of all these women who tempt men, etc. Um, and now women, you know, cheat on men, blah, blah, blah. And when I saw, he would never, bottom of page 343, right-hand column, 789, 788. And when I saw, he would never finish to read on this cursed book all night. In other words, he wouldn't shut up. She's having to listen to this. All suddenly, three leaves she grabs and rips out of the book. You know, again... Think how valuable this book is. Modern terminology, you would say it's probably worth thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars. You rip the pages out and it's worth pretty much nothing. Even though I know at least one of you paid a lot of money for a book with several pages missing. You ought to be able to take that back, by the way, and get all your money from the bookstore. So, she pulls three pages out. And also, with my fist, what? Punches him. Right on the cheek. So that he falls backwards in the fire. Okay? Yeah, it's pretty funny. And up he starts, as doth a wooden lion. No, no, not a wooden lion. Wode means mad, crazy. And what does he do? And with his fist, he smites me on the head. She punched him, he punches her back. So that she falls on the floor as though dead. And he's thinking, oh my God, I killed her. He was aghast and would have fled his way till at last out of my swoon, she wakes up. I said, uh, till at last in my moon, I swoon and awoke. Oh, hast thou slain me, false thief? Well, if she were dead, she wouldn't be speaking, right? So she's obviously not dead. I said, and for my land, thus hast thou murdered me? Ere I be dead, yet will I kiss thee. Hmm. 
She says, before I die, let me kiss you. And near he came and kneeled fair adown, that is, kneels beside her. And notice, he is now the model of gentility. Dear Sister Allison, sister doesn't mean, you know, incest. It just means dear one. Okay? Close relation, not genetic, marriage. As help me God, I shall never thee smite again. That I have done it, it is to thyself to blame. You shouldn't have egged me on. Well, that's not really right. Why is she to blame? According to Jenkins. You hit me first. I think that's what he means. I could be wrong. Uh, lost my place. Mr. Uh, forgive me and that I beseech. And yet, if soon she does what? As just before he finishes, she smacks him again. <laughs> Don't get in a fight with the wife of Bath, okay? She smacks him again, we're told, and said, Thief, thus much am I recta, avenge. In other words, now we're even. Now will I die. So why did she say, I'll give you a kiss before I die? What was she doing? Think within the course of the prologue. What does this mean? She's reeling him in. She's tempting him. Why? To get closer. Why? Because her arm's only this long. And he's here. She wants him here. So she can pop him one. <laughs> Got to teach him a lesson. Okay? But at last, with much care and woe, we fell accorded by Usalvin II. They became Jacor of one heart. They united. They reached a peace agreement. You know? Thing that ended the Vietnam War, the Paris Peace Accords, so to speak. He gave me all the bridle in my hand to have the governance of house and land and of his tongue and, hand, and his hand also and made him burn his book anon right then. So what does he give her? He gives her the bridle. What? What is she talking about? What do you use a bridle for? Steer a horse. Or to control the power of the horse. But here it's not the bridle of the horse. It's the bridle to have the governance of house and land. She has total control of what happens in the house and all of the land. Okay, Who all, was all that to begin with? Hers. He married into it. But in marrying, this is where that laws, the medieval laws that you, were, you two were both kind of alluding to, this is where the medieval laws said, if he marries her, guess what? They're his now. But if he dies, <laughs> they're back to being hers. Kind of makes, again, just me, my suspicious nature, kind of makes me wonder why she's had five husbands die. Okay? So, Governance of house, land, what else? Two more things. His tongue doesn't mean she cuts it off. Maybe. <laughs> and his hands. Why tongue and hands? Bingo. House, property, him, his body, her control. Okay? And she makes him burn the damn book. No more reading about the evils of women. Okay? And when that I had gotten unto me by mastery all the sovereignty, 
mastery, superiority, all the sovereignty, the rule. And then he said, my own true life. Do as the lust to term of all thy life. Lust means desire. Do whatever you want for the rest of your life. Now, is this the modern American whatever? No, it's not. He's saying, I want you to have joy and happiness. Whatever brings you joy and happiness, that's what I want you to have. Do that. Okay? Keep thine honor, keep my estate, and after that day, we never had debate. Why didn't they have debate? Well, they were of one heart. What's another reason? Maybe a little darker reason. She had control of that. She had control of his tongue. <laughs> like he starts and, <laughs> and she shuts him up. <laughs> I'm maybe reading into it a little bit. Okay? So, she says that I was such a good wife to him. There was never a better wife from Denmark to India. Look at a map. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now let me tell my, t tell my tale, she says. But before she does, the friar intervenes. He interrupts. Happens frequently in the Canterbury Tales. It's Chaucer's way of segueing from one story to another. Okay. The friar laughs. This is a long preamble of a tale. You know, really, lady, 830 lines. Get to the freaking point. And he laughs. And then the summoner says, by God's two arms, that's God's arms too, by the way, a friar will entremet him evermore, and you've got a gloss what that means, puts himself in the middle of things. There is prob probably, possibly, a sexual pun there. Because of the description of the friar in the general prologue. If you haven't listened to the, the one lecture where I talked about the prior, because we're, to, we're told that the prior, friar, not prior, friar pays for the weddings of young women in his district. Like, well, that's such a nice thing to do because these are poor women and they can't afford good weddings. Uh-uh, nope. We're told it's because, it's alluded to, it's because he is such a noble post unto the friars, the four kind of different groups of monks. Post. Upright. There is a Freudian pun going on there. The friar probably pays for the weddings because he's gotten the women pregnant. Or, at the very least, He's taken their virginity. He slept with them. Medieval times. Don't mean to gross anybody out, but it's kind of gross. I had people in my first class going, ew. <laughs> Medieval times, a couple gets married. What happens the next morning? Anybody know the custom? It's referred to in literature. Shakespeare refers to it in some of his plays. The morning after the wedding. Bloody sheets are hung out the window to show she was a virgin. If they're not, there's something else going on. Well, the friar kind of takes care of that by paying for the wedding, and then they just get, you know, some chicken blood or something and put that on the sheet because she wasn't a virgin before that night. He's deflowered them. So, the Sumner mentions that. Okay? Now the friar takes a shot at the sumner. Friar says, Now by my faith I shall, before I go, tell of a sumner such a tale or two that all the folk shall laugh in this place. The way Chaucer portrays the sumner is that the sumner is homosexual. All right? Watch a knight's tale. The depiction of the sumner, because in a knight's tale, we get Geoffrey Chaucer, we get a Sumner, we get a partner. The Sumner and the partner are traveling together. In the Can Canterbury Tales, the Sumner and the partner are traveling together. 
Okay? And the guy who plays the partner is a dead ringer for the depiction of the partner in the Canterbury Tales. And Chaucer says in A Knight's Tale, oh, I'm going to paint such a portrayal of you that everyone's going to know you forever. Okay? Same kind of thing that we get here. Finally, she gets to her tale. Finally, we get to her tale. In the old days of King Arthur, in other words, in a galaxy far, far away long ago, the land was full of elves, fairies, but it isn't anymore. Why? Okay, this is the wife speaking now. Why isn't the land full of fairies and elves anymore? Because of the friars. Okay, the friar interrupted her. So it's like she's thinking on the fly. She knows the kind of tale she wants to tell. So now she's giving us a new little mini prologue. There aren't any elves anymore because the friars have gone around with all of their holy water and incense and they've sensed in holy water to everything, sprinkled everything, and it's like, you know, a cross to a vampire. Makes them go away. So, she says, um, women, because of all this, because... The friars have, been, have done this, and the elves aren't there anymore. Women can safely go up and down the land. The implication is, you got women, you got to be careful of those fairies. They'll take you. Women may go safely up and down in every bush or under every tree. There is none other incubus but he. You've got a gloss, incubus. Devilish spirits would appear to women in dreams or thereby impregnate them. There is none other incubus but he, and he will not do them but dishonor. That is, will do them nothing but dishonor. Who's the he? She's talking about friars. So, ladies, it's okay for you to go up and down the land without a guard, without a guide, without a chaperone. But if you meet a friar, run. She's just taking her shot at the friar. But... In this house, in King Arthur's house, there was a lusty bachelor. And it happened one day, he gets up, gets on his horse, and he rides from over a river. Compare this to Longball. Longball gets on his horse, goes over a river, lays down next to a tree. Beautiful ladies show up. This guy gets on his horse, crosses over a river, and there's a young beautiful lady. He saw a maid walking before him, of which maid anon, <laughs> that is very soon, despite her will, by very force bereft her maidenhead. He rapes her. What did the knight's wife say to Sir Gowan? On the third day, I believe it was. We're here, we're alone, my husband's off the way. You're big and strong. I'm just a weak little woman. You could take me by force if you wanted to. If I were like a woman who would be so discourteous as to deny you. And he goes, um, in my country, we don't do that. In other words, you live among pigs, okay? So now I'm showing great honor and such there. This guy, not so much. So he rapes her. She runs to Arthur's court. Okay. The knight goes back. Arthur says, not touching this one. Guinevere, you, this is yours. <laughs> you step up. Guinevere get, assembles all the women of the court. So they're all going to be kind of jurors. And she says, 904, I'll grant you your life. You get a live. If you can tell me, what thing is it that women most desire? That's it. Cue up the Mel Gibson, Helen Hunt movie, What Women Want. Notice, that's like 1990s. That idea goes back to at least 1390s. Probably goes back a whole lot longer. Okay? What do women want most? 
Not what do women want. Because we're going to find out. They want a lot. Y'all want a lot. According to what is said in the tale. Okay? And he's like, okay, I'll find out. So he has a year. He goes off. 925. 924. Uh, 923. Whereas he might find in this matter two creatures. Uh, 923. 22. He could never find two women that would agree. He talks to a lot of women. He spends a year going out, asking. He never gets agreement. One wants one thing, one wants another, one wants another. We could go all the around, get all the women in MTSU, Murfreesboro, Nashville, Tennessee, United States, the whole freaking world, and there would never be agreement. Well, yeah, Why? That's, like a stupid, that's stupid. That's like acting like all men want the same thing. You're right. It's like dehumanizing women. It's like all. all dehumanizing women, dewomanizing women, women, if you want. But that's the fiction, okay? So. We get a big, long list of all the different things. We won't talk about all of them. What time we've got? Ten minutes. So, some want riches. They want wealth. Some want honor. Some want jolliness, jollity, to find that how you want. Some want clothes. Some want good sex in bed, lust a bed. Some want to be widowed and wed. Wife. <laughs> Okay. Some want to be flattered and pleased. And he's like, shit, I'm screwed. What else? Some want, and we go on and on and on and on. Okay. Time comes for him to turn around and head back home. He's not going to find the answer. I think probably if he found two people that agreed, he'd say that's it. But he doesn't. We get an appeal to authority. She refers to Ovid. So when he decides, line 983, he's not going to get the answer. He turns around, heads home. He couldn't delay. The day was come. He's heading home, and he sees 24 women dancing in a meadow. He's like, I haven't asked them. Maybe they know. He rides up to them. They disappear. Why? Not women. Probably fairies. But he does find a woman. No creature saw he that bare life, line 997, save on the green he saw sitting a wife. A fowler white there may no man devise. You can't imagine any woman uglier than this woman. So imagine the ugliest woman you can, and that's not uglier than this one. I had no idea what. Get on the internet, search, you know, images, ugly women, mash them all together, and you get the platonic ideal of ugly woman. That's her. Okay? Again, the night this old wife again arise. Again, against, that is towards. So she's sitting on the ground, he's on his horse, he looks at her, and I always kind of imagine he crosses himself like, my God, go away. She starts coming towards him. Sir Knight, hereforth, don't go away so quickly. Or, hereforth, there's, you, you, there's no way here. You can't get through here. Tell me what you seek, and maybe I can help you. Peradventure, it may the better be. These old folk know much things, said she. Why? Experience. I told my first class, I was reading a Substack article, finished this morning, started a couple days ago, about how the United, one of the ways the United States has gotten so screwed up is because we've segregated over the last hundred years into age groups that we didn't have over a hundred years ago. We have an, an entire group today just called teenagers. A hundred years ago, that word did not exist. We didn't think of people 13 to 19 as teenagers. They were on their way to being adults. They were working side by side, 
with adults. Okay? We had eight, nine, and ten year olds working side by side. Okay? I'm not talking about child labor laws, none of that. The guys, the whole thrust was young people can learn from working with, being in connection with, being in company with older people. And older people experience what from being around young people? There's a little life still left in me, kind of. That's why it's really good to have young people, teenagers and stuff, every now and then go into nursing homes. You'll see the residents kind of perk up a little. It's like getting a little shot of fresh blood, which, by the way, is also another way to make someone old feel a little bit young, literally. It's been studies, you know. So, I've seen a lot. My dear mother, what's he showing? Respect. Notice what he's not doing. Last time he met a single woman in the woods, what did he do? He raped her. This way. I'm dead. If I can't answer the question of what women most want. You can teach me that. I would well quite your hire. I would repay you very well. She goes, plight me thy troth, thy truth, thy word, thy loyalty. Right here in my hand, that is, shake on it. What? That the next thing I ask you'll do, if, if it's in your power. Okay, plight me my troth. Usually means what? Did then, as it does, we don't use it today. Become engaged to me. To plight one's troth is to get engaged. Okay? That's not what she asked for. And he says, she says, and I can tell you that answer right now. Before night. Yes! <laughs> he doesn't know what the request will be. She says, okay, your life's safe. Does she tell him the answer right then? Is he right on ahead? I know the answer, I know the answer. Give the answer and then leave? No. They go back together. And he says, 1038. Women desire to have sovereignty as well over their husband as their love for to be in mastery him above. This is your most Desire. Women want sovereignty. What? As over their husbands as their love. That is, body as well as the affection that is within. Okay? Could mean that. Could mean as over their effect, over their husband, as well as over their love. See the theirs. They can be ambiguous, especially the second one. Their love might refer to sovereignty over their own love. So, woman A has husband B, and the speaker is suggesting, control over husband B. But woman A gets to control her love. In other words, I'll give you some every now and then, but I'm also going to go see Fred and George and John and etc. Sleep where she wants. Possibility. Not saying that's the case. Okay? And in the court we're told there was neither wife nor maid nor widow that said, nope, not right. They all went, damn. She gave out the secret. You know, the secret recipe spilled. And then she says, oh queen, I have a request that he has promised to keep. Take me unto thy wife, line 1055. Because you know that you'd be dead if it weren't for me. The knight answers, alas and well away. Modern English, hell no. <laughs> Not if you were the last woman alive on earth. Not if you were the last living thing walking on two legs. Or four legs on no. 
Take all my goods, leave my body. Take all my wealth, but don't, mm, mm, no, just no. She says, I shrew us, I curse us both. Why? For though that I be foul, and this is the first time we're told this, old and poor. So she's not only ugly, she's older than dirt, man. I mean, wrinkles galore. She's a walking human wrinkle. And, <laughs> and poor. What does he mean? What does she mean by poor? Lowly born. Okay. I desire not for all the metal or the ore that is under the earth or that is above, for all the earth's riches or the riches of heaven. She says, I don't want anything but to be your wife in your love. That's it. That's all I want. My love? No! My damnation. You'll be the, de you know, the hell of me, woman. Why? That any of my nation should ever so foul, disparage be. What's he mean by my nation? Your gloss tells you family. What does he mean? My bloodline. That's what he means. My heritage. Not going forward, going backward. What is he saying is his heritage? We're high standing. We're aristocratic. Say that again? Oh, he's, he's not even going yet. Okay. We'll stop there. We'll spend about 10 minutes on... Tuesday or uh, Thursday when we come back. Remember, no class on Thursday. There's a quiz up due Friday, I think. A um, couple of lectures online. Watch those. Yes? Which day are we going to class? Tuesday. No, no class on Tuesday. We'll meet again on Thursday.